On the next Good Company, we'll see how to wear those glitter fashions for both day and evening this summer. And see what happens when Gary Lumpkin goes through police survival training. Hi, Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we're having hot dogs. <laughs> Frank? Uh, oh, we're having Franks! <laughs> Sounds like... Uh, knees... Uh, cheese! Uh, 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 cheese? Uh, Frank? Uh, what is all this stuff? Ah! Uh, Frank and Stuff, now with a tumble of cheese. Created by Hormel. Frank and Stuff with cheese! Ha! If you could ignore cramps, wouldn't you? If you could rid yourself of backache and headache, Free yourself from water weight gain and avoid monthly tension, wouldn't you? Now you can with new Extra Strength Multi-Symptom Relief Formula Pamperin. And none of these can relieve all of those symptoms. Can they? New Extra Strength Multi-Symptom Relief Formula Pamperin. Now stronger than ever. If you haven't tried it, shouldn't you? Celebrate Minnesota from Buffalo. Wednesday at 5 and 6. Leonard Bias died of cocaine intoxication. This interrupted the normal electrical control of his heartbeat, which resulted in the sudden onset of seizures and cardiac arrest. The coroner's test results showed Don Rogers had five times the amount of cocaine in his system that could be considered fatal. The toxicology study showed that there was a blood level of cocaine at 5.2 milligrams per liter. They pick up a newspaper or turn on a television set these days without being confronted with the headline of an athlete's career that's been cut short or interrupted because of drugs or alcohol. What is it that's causing these rising young stars to turn to such deadly addictions? And what can be done to stop it before it becomes an epidemic? We'll find out this morning on Twin Cities Live. <laughs> What was your drug of choice? My drug of choice was cocaine. Could what happened to Lynn Bias have happened to you? Very definitely. Now, how do you feel when you see those press conferences and read those stories in the paper about what happened? Uh, what I feel is, is that it's taken us a long time to get to that point. And I think that the, um, I've had many complaints about the media, about them glamorizing the, the use of drugs by athletes and not really talking about the danger of the drug. How do you feel in your heart, though, when you see those stories? Does something in there ever say, God, that could have happened to me? Uh, yes, uh, it, uh, I know that it could have happened to me. In fact, during my experiences, it did happen to some of my friends. Uh, so I'm very aware of what, what uh, the cocaine can do. And, uh, I just think that it's taken a really a long time to bring this type of reality to, to the American public. What happened to you? Was it alcohol first? Uh, I began to drink alcohol in high school and uh, continued to drink uh, uh, even though I was in athletics through college. Uh, after I finished my uh, eligibility at the University of Minnesota, I began with uh, marijuana, smoked marijuana for, um, f for some time, and uh, then several years later got into cocaine and began to use cocaine very heavily and uh, before my uh, trade out to Seattle I was very heavily involved with cocaine while I was playing with the Minnesota Vikings. Didn't anybody know what was going on? No one really knew. I think there were suspicions uh, but they did not really know how to detect or how to confront really until I uh, had reached a point where uh, uh, I was just not being responsible and my character changed quite drastically. How did it change and how how were you not <coughs> responsible? What did you do? Well, well, things like I would not uh, show up for practice or, or I would not be there for meetings or training camp. And, uh, and this is simply uh, a, a very different way, a very different Carl Eller because uh, I was not that kind of person. And, and when they saw me doing these kinds of things, uh, uh, they didn't know what the problem was, but certainly they knew that something was wrong with me. Bud Grant doesn't put up with that stuff, does he? No, Bud Grant doesn't put up with that stuff, but they had a different system in the National Football League and certainly with the Minnesota Vikings at that time. They looked at this in terms of a disciplinary problem or a behavior problem, and their way of dealing with it was to impose a fine on the player. 
And of course, the player would just simply pay the fine, but it did not receive help. So what's the biggest fine you ever paid? Oh, probably a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars. And that was what, a drop in the bucket compared to what you were well, making or spending on drugs? Well, comparatively, yes, uh, but it was not significant enough that it would uh, make an impact on me to, to want to uh, stop using drugs, uh, particularly at that point of my, my life and career. If someone had come to you and said, look, you've got a problem, let's get you straightened out, what would you have done? Uh, I think if they had just said I had a problem, I probably would have denied it. But had they said uh, I had a problem and that they would offer me some help, I probably would have been very interested in what they could have offered me. Didn't you at all ever think that kids were looking up to you? Uh, that uh, brought a lot of shame on me personally in my career because, yes, I knew that I was using drugs, and yet and still when I'd walk outside the stadium, some little kid would walk up to me and say, I want your autograph, or some father would say, my son really looks up to you, and I would leave there and I'd go home and do drugs. I was very ashamed about that. That is probably still one of the most hurting memories that I have of my career. How bad did it get? Uh, it got very, very bad for me. Um, the unfortunate thing was that I went through my entire career without getting help and, um, of course, used, used vast amounts of the things that I worked for and earned and uh, basically lost my reputation and self-respect during my career before I ended up getting, getting help. Did you have to bottom out? I did bottom out. Yeah. Bill, what was it for you? Well, I, uh, what my drug of choice was alcohol. And uh, when I <clears throat> see I began drinking uh, probably like my late teens and uh, uh, it uh, rapidly uh, progressed uh, probably uh, what uh, in uh, my mid-twenties. You were one of the great hockey stars of your time. Well, uh, How did you feel when those kids came up to you and asked you for autographs? Or did it ever occur to you that you were doing anything wrong or that you had a problem? Well, it, uh, not uh, not at that point in time, you know, like uh, uh, with the alcohol, it's uh, uh, kind of the way of life, uh, you know, that uh, uh, as a hockey player, you know, that uh, type of thing, macho image, you know, that you have to, uh, uh, you know, like after practice or after a game, you know, that, uh, 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 that you kind of have a couple of beers or whatever. How many and, beers? Well, that, you know, it would vary that uh, you might have, you know, like a six pack, you know, three or four beers after a practice and that. But it used to progress quite a bit. And, and uh, I was, you know, then it just started, you know, then it just got out of hand. And uh, it bothered me quite a bit uh, that uh, as far as, you know, like my image was concerned, which is, a, I would think was a big priority to me because I think that uh, as a as a pro athlete like that, you you know there's a lot of kids that do look up to you, and uh, uh, I was much more or less a uh, a closet drinker. I used to uh, I do a lot of my drinking at home, uh, and probably not too much out in public. How bad did it get? Oh, it got real bad. It was uh, at a point there where like I was uh, like I've been through treatment four times. So it's, it's been something that's uh, been an ongoing battle for me. It's, uh, it's an everyday thing for me, but I take it one day at a time. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's um, uh, uh, something that you got to be aware of all the time. You know, we take Carl's addiction to cocaine very, very seriously now. But we still, as a society, don't take your addiction to alcohol very seriously, do we? Well, it's, you know, I mean, uh, with the alcohol, I mean, uh, it's legal. I mean, you can go out and buy it. Uh, and, and like you see it uh, what on TV, uh, I mean, on, on holidays, uh, whether it's Christmas, Fourth of July, or something like this, you'll see where, uh, you know, what they say, why don't you get in the spirit and, uh, you know, uh, have a bottle of, uh, uh, of whiskey or else buy like a case of beer or something like this. And, and uh, it, it's, it's uh, I think that uh, the, because it's legal, I, you know, they think it's okay, uh, and uh, which is false. How do you feel when you saw that videotape at the beginning of the show? Uh, I'm real sad uh, because I mean, like myself and Carl, you know, like we're talking about it, and, and uh, it, it's just uh, you know, like to me, now, uh, 
by having more knowledge as far as the alcohol is concerned and drugs and knowing what it can do to you. And, and here's a young fellow, uh, which is 22. Uh, I have a real tough time trying to really understand, you know, uh, because it, it, it is. Either one is a deadly, deadly disease. And, uh, but it could have just as easily killed you. Sure. And uh, I would say several times. Uh, I was at the point where my last two treatments, I mean, like I was, uh, you know, like I was suicidal drinking. And, uh, uh, and that's what that was. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, something that you're just playing, you know, like Russian roulette with. How could this happen in our country today? What is going on? Before this day is over, 5,000 of our friends and our neighbors and our relatives will try cocaine for the first time. And a great many of those first time triers will end up in hospitals with hearts that are vibrating out of control. A third of those first time triers will become addicted to cocaine. What are we gonna do about it? Stay with us on Twin Cities Live. I'm Ruth Spencer, and watching Eyewitness News on Tuesday, you found our exclusive News Star coverage as three former Gophers stand trial in Wisconsin. We'll update you on that later on today. Also today, you'll find a Minnesota celebration live from Buffalo and the oldest rodeo in the state. And a different sort of celebration begins at Orchestra Hall, the 7th Annual Zomerfest. Celebrate Minnesota with Eyewitness News. With high end 57 sauce, even I can do a great barbecue. You? Me. Two parts Heinz 57, one part honey brush on. Honey and spice glaze. Make Heinz 57 sauce your recipe for success. Mmm. You? Me. Mm. <laughs> you know, Heinz 57 sauce is so tangy and delicious, it makes a terrific barbecue sauce right out of the bottle. Make Heinz 57 sauce your recipe for success. So, whether it's recipes or straight from the bottle, next barbecue, make it Heinz 57 sauce. Ma, we didn't invite you here to clean the kitchen. I don't mind. At least take another paper towel. We've been using that one for half an hour. It's perfectly fine. Ma, it's disposable. But it's still good. Bolt is so strong and so sturdy that in tests, it actually stood up to a washing machine. Here's Scott Towels. Here's Bounty. And here's Bolt. Drop it, Ma. It's still good. Drop it. It's still good. Drop it. Bolt, the super strong and sturdy paper towel. Quiet, people. This is a casting session. Next is Daisy June from Oshkosh. Too young. Too young. young. Not just any cow can be a polka dot dairy cow. We pick the finest cows to bring you the freshest dairy products. Dottie from Fergus Falls. Oh, you're beautiful. Look for polka dot dairy products at Tom Thumb, Kenny's, and other fine stores. Dottie is yours for just six fifty with a qualifying purchase at participating stores. I hate these cattle calls. How about a nursery rhyme this morning? This is pretty good. Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Jack, jump over the candlestick. Jill, be nimble. Jump it, too. If Jack can do it, so can you. Huh? Well, that's uh, not a passage from Mother Goose's nursery rhymes. Rather, it's a new version written by Father Gander, who says that the traditional nursery rhymes that we all read to our children and loved as a child can be harmful to our health. He calls Mother Goose a racist, a sexist, and a promoter of child abuse. Come join us in our studio audience on Monday morning on Twin Cities Live. You'll also meet a child or psychiatrist who has rewritten our favorite fairy tales for the same reason. Imagine things like Mac and the Beanstalk or Dorothy and the Lizard of Oz. Could the stories and poems that we read to our kids be dangerous to them? Call us at 641-1298 right now and bring your kids to Twin Cities Live on Monday morning. Bottom line, I think they should be kicked out. <laughs> Bottom line. Well, I know one thing. I have two boys, and they're in junior high school and high school. And it really gives them a bad example. And they think the athletes are stupid. So, and there are a lot of other little kids, and these are the guys that they respect. I don't know, I think they should be put in jail, just like everybody else. I think athletes that are found using drugs should be put into a rehabilitation program and not penalized because they're sick. 
It's a disease like uh, any other disease and uh, not necessarily uh, kicked out of athletics or anything like that. If they're in college and they're caught using drugs and perhaps suspended from play, but that's the maximum. I think, first of all, we have to deal with what's going on inside of them, the emotional. I think that's the most important. Number one, and from there, we can take off to something else. So my concern is for them as an individual. Uh, actually, the problem should be looked at in light of what's happening on a national basis. And I'm wondering why athletes are single out. I'm wondering what Carl Eller has to say about that. What do you have to say about that, Carl Eller? Well, what I have to say about that is I, I think that's an appropriate question because uh, what I see is I do see the athletes being singled out regardless of what's happening in our society today. I think the uh, athletes have been selected to take on a responsibility that I think in all of society should, should share. Good morning. You're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. Yes, I have a couple of comments, I guess. One is, um, or a, a question, why do these two gentlemen believe that that all the advertisements on TV, the commercials for alcohol, are portrayed by sports figures, and also what their opinion on most all these. I know in my neighborhood, all the bars, all the lounges, all the places that sell alcohol promote athletic. They sponsor all our athletic teams. And they have softball teams and right, all the right, and all hockey. That. Yeah. Right. You know, everything. What, what is their opinion and what kind of an impact do you think that... that we have makes? linked those two together, haven't we? <laughs> well, the, the, the reason they do that is because athletics has a tremendous appeal, particularly to the general public. And uh, there's been a study by, uh, uh, I think, Miller Brewing Company, and the reason they advertised so heavily with the athletic events was because they found that most of their buyers, like the male, adult male population, really responded to the uh, sports world. And so there is an attraction there. Is it an unfair attraction? Uh, no, sports should not be an un unfair attraction. You have to realize that the brewers and the distillers are jumping on that and taking advantage of that popularity to peddle their product. To peddle their drug? Yes. Good morning. You're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. Yes. My, I have a comment. I was an athlete in college, and I do not feel that mandatory drug testing is going to help those that are already that far into drug use. They're going to just give up their athletic careers. I'm real aware of addictive personalities, and uh, I think that's one thing. The other thing is um, athletics is supposed to instill in people a responsible attitude, and by the time you're in college, if you, don't, if you need someone to tell you what to do, I think that you, you need more guidance in, in your area of learning who you are, what you need, but uh, I am so against the mandatory testing. Well, let's try to find out, all right? Let's well, try to find because, out. Simply because I myself practiced the use of drugs when I was in college being an athlete. However, what did it, you wasn't, do? it wasn't what? daily use. It was social use. And to this point in my life, I'm not addicted. So if they had tested me in college, I would be off the team. But it wasn't daily use. It was once in a while smoking some dope at a party or whatever. It never affected me. I never used while I was playing. Wait a minute. You think she should have been off the team for once in a while? You're darn right she should have. I, I have drugs that there's no place to do it in with sports. I'm very deaf against it. Let's find out what some other people think, all right? Uh, Bill Weiss is the director of chemical dependency awareness and assistance program at the University of Minnesota. He counsels faculty, staff, students, and is a recovered chemically dependent person. And uh, also with us today is Greg Coleman from the Minnesota Vikings. He is the assistant NFL player representative. How do you feel when people say that uh, the players should not be subjected to what Pete Rozelle was talking about, the mandatory drug testing? Well, it's a very delicate issue. And I think we need to clarify one thing, that the players are not totally against a drug program. We feel and we know that we, you know, some of us in this league have a problem. Uh, we've addressed it, and what we're trying to do is come up with a program that'll, that'll work for both parties. And I think what the players are balking at is a way that the Commissioner Pete Rozelle tried to impose or is trying to impose this mandatory drug testing. We already have a drug program, and I think there are some flaws in it. It needs to be tightened up. We need to get a stronger program with some, you know, with some more bite in it. 
but the main thing is confidentiality. That has been, you know, it's, it's been betrayed mm -hmm. by a lot of players. A lot of guys go in seeking help, they need help, you know, they've, <clears throat> they've taken the first step, and it's crucial. But the thing that they've got to deal with now is a publicity issue, you know, their names and families, you know, they're being raped through the media. You know, these guys are selling stories, sensationalizing these, you know, these quote-unquote famous people. And, and then that's another problem. They've admitted one, yes, I have a drug problem, I need help. But then the second phase, you know, uh, you know the exposure that it's, it's undue and it's unfair. Uh, the players want to have some type don't you, of if, say. Don't you, if you're making a million dollars a year, and if you're looked up to by kids all over our country, don't you give up some of your rights to publicity, to privacy, to whatever? Aren't you kind of a special person? Sure you are. Shouldn't the standards be but different? But society has placed you in that position. It was not by, by, it was not by your choice. You chose the it profession. Wasn't? You chose the profession that happens to be quote unquote in the limelight or glamour or a role model or whatever. Uh, a lot of guys don't 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 really get off on, on being a, a role model for, for you. Some do, but a lot don't. But that's been placed on. I mean what what are the answers? I don't know. If I had the answers, boy, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here now. Uh, I'd probably be out uh, trying to do something about it. What are the answers on the university level? Well, you know, uh, the university looks at alcoholism and drug dependency as a disease. And it's a very viable disease, but over the period of years, the university has developed a program to help people. And I think, Greg, one of the issues he talked about confidentiality is essential. Because folks that come to see me, if I'm going to tell, quote, administration personnel, whoever it may be, who these individuals are, the trust would be gone. And obviously, the program wouldn't work. And any, any good viable workable program has to be confidential it has to be the the cooperation between management and labor in the national football league carl whether it be uh goldie when he was playing for the uh, north stars these are employees these are employees but, but we're also talking about students here i mean shouldn't the rules be a little bit different well okay now the uh, uh, the program that i direct shouldn't the rules be tougher tougher with what for students for student athletes Tougher for student there athletes. are a lot of people here, I think, who believe that if a student athlete uses cocaine, uses drugs, uses marijuana, even recreationally, he ought to be off the team. You know, I, you know, we, we talk about, you know, the problem in the National Football League, but I think where the edu you know, educating is a key, and I think for once we've got to educate these athletes, and not only once they get to a professional level, they know everything there is there is to be known about drugs. But get him down into high schools and even out into junior high schools, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thoroughly believe that, and I've said it over and over and over again. Um, I'm a CD counselor, and I agree with you. I think education is very important. I believe it's a disease, and uh, I believe that uh, a person should be given the opportunity to learn about that disease and the problem they have. Because most people I see who come for treatment are in denial, and they don't realize they have a problem to begin with. And giving them that opportunity and to return to the, uh, the team, I think, is a very respectful thing to do respecting the disease. Good morning, you're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask Carl a question. Alcohol is legal, so you can't do anything about that. But I was wondering if he had ever thought about turning in the drug dealer that he dealt with, uh, or did he have some kind of weird kind of allegiance to him uh, that uh, stopped him from doing it? Uh, my own personal opinion is that yes, I have uh, an allegiance uh, to the people that sell and, 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 uh, and do drugs. That allegiance is, is that they have decided a choice of vocation uh, that they are uh, par partaking in. When we look at an industry, we have not looked at the drug dealer. A lot of people make their living on selling drugs, peddling drugs, illegally or illegally. I look at my own responsibility because if I were not a drug user, this guy would not have been in business. No one ever made me take drugs. No one ever forced me to buy drugs. And so the, the question is, with a lot of the drug programs, is they want to get rid of the drug people. Uh, but when you do that, they just move on to something else. Is That's the testing, industry. Is the testing a fair thing to do? Can you beat the test? Can the tests be wrong? We'll find out when we continue in just a minute. Remember that special feeling called summer? Remember the taste of summer nectarines, 
So tangy, sweet, and good for you. Summer, summer fruits from California, fresh from the tree, taste them and see. They have that special flavor that only summer can bring. But like summer, they'll soon be just a sweet memory. Summer, summer fruits, it wouldn't be summer without summer, us. Summer fruits, summer in recent years, most innovations in frozen pizza have come in the area of crust. Thicker crusts, thinner crusts, lighter crusts, crustier crusts. Double Top Pizza from Tombstone puts the crust where it belongs, on the bottom of the top. And our crusts are doing double duty because Double Top doubles the toppings. Double the meat, double the cheese, double the taste. Double Top Pizza from Tombstone. You'll think twice before you buy anything else. Right now, Dairy Queen, an American original, has America's favorite hot dog on sale for just 39 cents. Plump and juicy with mustard and ketchup. Find out why it's America's favorite hot dog. Now only 39 cents. I tell you, that's a top dog. At a rock bottom price. At Dairy Queen, an American original. Hard water stains are a resting place for bacteria and fungus. You should use Lime Away right away. It's formulated to clean away hard water stains. The bacteria and fungus are carried away, too. Don't let hard water stains build up. Use Lime Away. And now, from the makers of Lime Away, a new extra strength toilet bowl cleaner and disinfectant for hard water stains. Look, it starts to clean and disinfect on contact without the hard work. Lime Away toilet bowl cleaner. Extra strength, extra easy cleaning. On Tuesday morning on Twin Cities Live, you'll meet former Mamas and Papas star Michelle Phillips. Come join our studio audience and find out why she was fired from one of the leading groups of the 1960s. How did she cope with the drugs and the jealousy that ultimately drove her apart from Papa John Phillips? And how is she faring as an actress with shows like Hotel and Love Boat? Michelle Phillips will reveal all, and you can be a part of the show. Come join us. Tickets are free. The number is 641-1298. Give us a call right now. amazing piece that's uh, part of Carl's story how did you do all that in the condition that you were in well the uh, the progression uh, took place over a number of years uh, throughout my career I uh, did not uh, begin as an addicted person even though I ended up as an addicted person uh, that's uh, part of the problem in the in sports and uh, some of the reasons why the programs that we've seen before have really not uh, been effective because we normally think of health in an athlete as a person that can perform on the field and we don't see the underlying the problems that mm -hmm. are that exist within so the do athlete. the drugs make you perform better uh, no the drugs did not make me perform better in fact they took away from my performance and uh, in the end they uh, made my performance such that uh, I wasn't able to continue my career okay um, is it true that you once owned or um, once had a liquor store of your own Yes, that is true. I did own a liquor store at one time. Good morning. You're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. Hi. Um, in May, Steve Howe was tested by the San Jose Bees in the morning, mm -hmm. and it turned out positive. Uh, that same afternoon, the Toronto Blue Jays tested him, and it turned out negative, and he was later reinstated. What, um, I know in this country there's no such thing as innocence. Once the papers, once you're charged with the crime, 
if you're found not guilty, you got off. It's not that, it's not that you were innocent, you got off. And if I was an athlete, I'd be worried about not taking it, taking the test, having it turned, uh, having it turned out positive, because no matter what I said la later or what the team said later, I was a user. And if it's that important, how come they should be starting with airline pilots and CEOs, not with athletes? Uh, let's find out from Dr. Gary Peterson, who is the medical examiner for Hennepin County. Uh, is it possible that those tests are wrong that Steve Howe has been going through? He says that he is clean. I think the tests are, are reliable. The last uh, 10 years or so, the quality of the tests, the precision, the accuracy, the sensitivity of those tests has improved. I think that the phenomenon that the question was uh, alluding to really is where the uh, trigger limit is set in the testing system. How much of a trace is permitted to uh, provide a margin of safety so that there aren't false positive tests. So how the test is set up and how it's run can possibly produce a uh, So are you saying that the trigger limit was perhaps set <coughs> lower for the Toronto test than it was for the for the other test? It may be, and I think that in that type of testing, usually there's a, a tendency to set the test to exclude falsely uh, positive tests, uh, maybe passing up some uh, uh, tests as, as positive. In other words, producing a false negative test. The testing is uh, typically set uh, in a conservative way so as to protect the, uh, the test recipient. How long does cocaine stay in your, in your blood system, in your body? It depends on the dose, and it depends on how much the individual... For a recreational user, like we keep hearing about. Typically, we're talking in, in a period of, of a day or two. Uh, it can vary. It can vary with the individual. It can vary with the dose of the drug. It takes longer to metabolize, to burn off a greater dose of drugs. And then again, it depends on just how that test is set up, where the trigger level is in terms of uh, where positivity is going to be reported as being positive or negative, how much of a trace might be allowed before the before the test becomes positive. And so what was it that killed the two players? <clears throat> uh, cocaine can probably kill half a dozen different ways. Uh, it's an extremely potent drug. It's one that uh, puts the body into overdrive, so to speak. Uh, it can have an effect on the central nervous system, produce convulsions that can be fatal. It can raise the blood pressure and cause hemorrhage from a weakened blood vessel. It can cause the heart to uh, over uh, exert itself, it can produce a literally a heart attack, it can cause loss of electrical control of the heart, and then sometimes adulterants in the drug can have their own reaction, or there can be something akin to an allergic reaction to the drug. Probably a half a dozen different mechanisms that take place. Last year, a friend of mine is a professional football player, uh, defensive end, weighed uh, 268 pounds, six foot five. He was on a drug rehabilitation center and treatment for nine months. Then uh, he got out, he asked me to help get him in shape, train him, and I got him back in shape, but uh, just before uh, training camp, and he ended up going back on cocaine again. And I spoke to him and asked him, um, you know, how did you get started? He said it happened in college, uh, going to a lot of different parties, and a lot of uh, businessmen, young, in their early 30s, uh, early 40s, would have, you know, the cocaine available. It was always available to him at the parties, and he got hooked on it then, and he was traded from uh, one professional team to another. Is this something that we provide in our colleges today? I think, you know, I think one thing we should talk about, when you talk about cocaine addiction, you're talking about alcoholism, you're talking about all types of drugs. And, you know, basically, uh, the, the young man in reference to the individual that went back to using after nine months of treatment, you know, denial is the primary obstacle in recovery for chemical dependency. And I think we have to be aware that some people are going to take this all the way to their grave. Some people will die from alcohol and drug dependency. There are many, many people, whether it be in the National Football League or at the University of Minnesota, they're in a recovery process, but it's a continuing program. <laughs> as far as the testing, to me, testing, inadvertently testing, drug testing is like changing seats on the Titanic. I don't feel it's going to prove anything. Simply from the standpoint of an alcoholic addict myself, we're going to find a way to get around it. There's going to be a way we get around it. We're going to find a drug, regardless of Could what you it have is, gotten around it, our system. Well, I, I did get around the system there for 15 years, all of my career. <laughs> they never detected me, and, and that's part of, part of it. But they if, they'd had the, if they'd they had not the have, mandatory they testing, they if did not Pete have, Rosell had come in three times a year as a surprise and tested you, you surely would have gotten caught. 
Uh, I, I'm not so sure that I would. Let me say this about mandatory testing. Many of these people are proposing mandatory testing because they look at it as a deterrent for drugs. We have uh, since uh, began to talk about the Lynn Bias case. There are three players right now in the National Basketball Association. That is uh, Michael Ray Richardson, uh, David Thompson, and uh, John Logan. And these people were uh, cut, their careers were cut short because of the, the, the drug testing. They were uh, sent out of the league. They're no longer playing basketball. Now, Lynn Bias knew this. Lynn Bias probably knew about the NBA program more than anybody, and it did not stop him from using drugs. So I think that that's just completely false when we say that this is going to be a, a deterrent. What I do, and the, the player that you were talking about, is that, that the, my programs are different because we can talk to the athlete about a lot of the things when they go to these treatment centers that they don't get a chance to discuss. And we have seen this uh, recurring illness in athletes like the ones I just mentioned, the Steve Howells, and that they do not get well because a lot of their problems are not addressed uh, in their treatment program. Good morning. You're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, I was on the methadone program for 11 years. I was taking 80 milligrams of methadone a day, every day. I got addicted to drugs while I was doing time in the state penitentiary. I mean, there's more drugs in the uh, state penitentiary than there is on the streets. Uh, what I'd like to ask Mr. Eller is uh, the uh, psychological aspects of withdrawing off of methadone. Uh, even a physician don't understand what it's like. You. Uh, I uh, have to go through it to really understand the uh, psychological and the uh, physical aspects of the withdrawal. It's uh, probably the hardest drug in the world to withdraw off of. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Eller if uh, he could give me any advice as to how I can, uh, you know, st st keep off of drugs and uh, st stay drug free. I, I have went to several uh, physicians about this and uh, they claim that uh, they have no understanding of this whatsoever. And uh, I would use... also like to close by saying that I've always respected Mr. Eller as an athlete. Now I respect him as a person. I think that takes quite a bit of courage what he's doing. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Well, thank you. I appreciate what you're saying. The most important thing about what you said is that he had gone to physicians and they could not help him. And this is something I think that's important for the public to understand uh, because I certainly see this happen in the National Football League. Because a person is a physician or a PhD, they go to them and ask them about solutions for this problem and they have no understanding about what the life of the athlete is like. In terms of uh, his other question about how to get off uh, methadone, I don't believe in a uh, chemical maintenance program, replacing one chemical for the other. Some people do. It's just a difference in philosophy. What I believe is that you have to get in touch with your feelings and your emotions because I think that uh, dependency is, a, is an emotional illness. And we use the drugs and we use other behaviors to cover up what we normally or naturally feel. Doctor, how have we been fooled for so long that cocaine was not chemically addicting? It was the champagne drug. You know, we heard people talking about uh, uh, young businessmen using it all over town and not worrying at all about it. I think it was misinformation for a long time. Uh, it was looked on as a non-addicting drug because it didn't addict in the same way that the narcotics addicted uh, people. It, uh, uh, it worked in a, different, in a different way, but addiction, reliance on cocaine has been known for years. William Halstead, who was one of the pioneers of surgery in this country, was a hopeless cocaine addict, one of the people who first did research on it. It was well known, but it addicted in a different way. It didn't addict physically in the same way. It was more of a psychological And is the most addiction. addictive form of cocaine what's called crack? Well, it's one of the forms uh, that produces the uh, highest and most rapid uh, response to the cocaine, and that's why it's so addicting. We're getting it in more quickly in a more mm -hmm. concentrated form. And how much crack body. use is there on campus? I've, I've seen crack come on campus uh, four or five months ago. It's not an epidemic. It's not the issue. It's being used more prevalently simply because of the price. And as the doctor said, the, the euphoria. And an addict loves euphoria. And they love the high, and that's basically part of the addiction. But uh, crack will be more prevalent. See, a dime bag of dope will cost you 20 bucks, Carl, whatever. And the same amount of crack or rock will, uh, will, will cost about the same. So if you're going to use drugs, use something that you get the real high out. So real what euphoria. is the epidemic on campus? 
Pardon? What is the epidemic drug on campus? I don't think there is an epi epidemic drug on campus. I Alcohol? don't feel that, wait a minute, I don't feel that the addiction rate at the university is any higher than the boardroom at 3M. National statistics mandate that. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Now there's something new at your local weight loss clinic. It's the Fast Finish program. Only $49. It's designed for people with pounds, not time to lose. When I was overweight, I never would have done this. Teresa Williams lost 45 pounds at the weight loss clinic. Now that I'm slim, I find myself doing things and going places like never before. Thank you, weight loss clinic. I can't tell you how much my life has changed since I went to weight loss clinic. Carol Williams lost 62 pounds at the clinic and went from a size 20 to a size 8. Every day seems special. I get compliments from people. Thank you, Weight Loss Clinic. If you have pounds, not time to lose, get the Fast Finish program for only $49 at any weight loss clinic. It can help you lose up to 5 pounds per week. This special program is available through this Friday only, so call today for more information. Remember, only Weight Loss Clinic can give you the fast finish for your weight problem. Call now. Oh, don't you hate it when people say, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? I used to. Mm -hmm. No one asked me, you know, because I know what I want. Like what? A successful career in business. You are really sold on that business training you took last year, aren't you? It got me where I am today, and it make it where I want to be tomorrow. Do you think business career training would be a good idea for me? Find out. Call Minnesota School of Business, 341-2221, to get your free brochure. Get the training to start going places. Call 341-2221. Once again, Super Value presents Believe It or Don't. It's easy to believe this airline caused more than a few people to miss their connection to Omaha. But can you believe 24-ounce Country Time Sugar Sweetened Mix is $159, 14-ounce Heinz Ketchup is only 59 cents, and 12-ounce Flavorite 100% Pure Orange Juice is 49 cents. Believe it. So hurry to Super Value for prices even more astonishing than this airborne defense system that actually came in under budget. Uh, you had a question you, you wanted to ask. Yeah, I did. In one of the recent issues of the journal, Dr. Forrest Tennant talked about what he called the post-drug impairment syndrome, in which a recovering cocaine addict and athlete would be unable to maintain that competitive edge that they had previously. As a matter of fact, he went on to say in his observations that only maybe 10 to 20 percent of the top professional athletes were able to reach that competitive edge that they had previously. Uh, what is your comments on that? I disagree uh, because I think a an athlete is born and trained and reared to believe that, uh, you know, he can continue to do anything. Sometimes you feel invincible, you know, even though this is a very, very traumatic drug and it has effects. And sometimes, you know, like Carl mentioned, he went through the league 15 years, all pro, I mean, the best defensive lineman in the National Football League. I mean, so that didn't deter his, uh, his, his uh, performance. Uh, so I, I disagree with that. Well, like I played well, you know, like when I was using the alcohol, but I have second thoughts now. I mean, you know, maybe I could have been better. Uh, that's the point that I'm saying at. And, and like it got to the point there with me where, where uh, uh, like near the uh, tail end of my career with my drinking, I, I used to play uh, uh, with a 200 pounds, and I was down to 172 pounds. What he's pounds. saying, though, is that these people, <coughs> they may be able to reach their previous limit, but then they relapse. And the problem is, is well, they relapse. Let me, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Is, is that uh, Forrest Tennant is getting a lot of publicity and a lot of notoriety, but I really don't think he knows very much about what's happening with athletes uh, or treating athletes, particularly athletes with cocaine addiction. The reason that they have a, have a relapse and, uh, is because is that through playing athletics, they achieve a natural physical high that's very, very similar to the cocaine addiction. And so when they place an athlete back into competition, he reaches that level. 
that makes him feel the close similarity between the previous addiction. And that triggers that mood-altering, seeking drug behavior. And, and the other thing is that it's completely false that athletes cannot return to their previous level. I have seen athletes that I have worked with have not only returned but have exceeded. They are playing without the addiction. And they are playing without any of those encumbrances that they were under when they were using the drug. So you've been involved in Carl's program. Why does it work? Why does Carl's program work? What makes well, it different? Uh, uh, well, what I think is, you know, they were dealing with uh, 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 some of the issues, I mean, like what Carl was talking about, that uh, I can relate to with Carl. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm any better than anybody else, any alcoholic or any person that you know, has a drug problem, but the uh, treatments that, uh, you know, that I've been through and you know, like dealing with issues, uh, I found it real tough. Uh, and so when I start talking to Carl and, you know, and some other pro-athlete people that, are, uh, uh, that we can kind of relate to each other and, and, and we can talk about things and uh, uh, I find that very easy, you know, that I can talk with Carl and, and we can share experiences uh, and to uh, get more of our You know, after what, after what the two of you have been through, I just can't understand how you wouldn't feel that the mandatory testing would be important, that we shouldn't come down hard on any kind of a university program that allows any kind of drug addiction of any kind in its program. Gene. That wouldn't just throw them out. Is a question I'm going to put back to you. Uh, Football players are part of society. You guys are part of society. How many of the people in the viewing audience would agree to mandatory drug testing on your present job? I don't know. Would you agree? What do you do for a living? Uh, I remodel homes, and I, I definitely... Should we mandatorily test uh, home remodelers? I, I would think that if you're not afraid of getting caught using drugs, why would you be afraid of taking it? I don't have a problem with mandatorily testing talk show hosts. I, what my problem is, my problem is that we have spent 20 years declaring war on drugs, and we've got to start waging war on well, drugs. Well, I, I just read this morning We're killing where, people. where the Reagan administration are, you know, now sending troops and arms down to Bolivia. You know, it's, it's, it's not here. Once it gets to this level, you know, it's kind of out of our hands. You know, we've got to start back in the back roots, you know, with the pushers and educating our young people. What about human error? The tests are going to have human error. Are you going to be the one willing to ruin someone's career with human error? Are they going to have human error? <clears throat> well, I've done that kind of test, and I've relied on it. I've relied on it, on it as a physician. I've testified in cases where it's been the pivotal issue in a case, and I've relied on it in that sense. Typically, when a test is positive, there can be retesting. There's follow-up testing. And there's reconfirmation by using a different technique, a completely different approach to confirming <coughs> it. I think that the, the worry about human error is not as great as, as the question. Good morning. You're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. I can't understand why Greg Coleman is so dead set against testing when using drugs is against the law. I'm not dead set against drug testing. Don't get me wrong. Listen, I'm not a drug user. I've never used drugs. I didn't even drink champagne at my wedding. So if anyone knows me, they know exactly where I stand. The issue that the Players Association is opposed to is the way that the commissioner is going about implementing this drug program. Please understand that. We as players realize that we've got to have a better drug program. It's just that the commissioner is violating our collective bargaining agreement. It's an agreement that we all fought and struck for back in 1982. And if he can, if he can go in and, and take something out of this collective bargaining agreement, what's to say that he can't pull something else out under the integrity of the game? I don't know. That's the only thing that the Players Association is opposed to. God knows there are, and I don't know the percentages, there are thousands and thousands of players who, you know, we've got, to, we've got to do something. We've realized that. But it's just the way that the commission is going about implementing this drug program. Don't get me wrong, we're not opposed to a drug program. Stay with us. We'll be right back on Twin Cities Live. I agree.
Would you let your daughter date Prince? This week's People tells how a lucky fan became Prince's date for his new movie premiere. People celebrates people as Legal Eagles director draws new style from Redford and Winger. Next, Boy George's brother exposes Boy's heroin addiction and Scotland Yard moves in to sort out the scandal. Then, Susan Lucci from All My Children sweats out Erica's seventh chance for this elusive Emmy and much more. Week after week, People celebrates people. This week, Prince brightening his image. C and H. Remember that special feeling called summer? Remember the taste of summer plums? Sweet, juicy, tart, and tangy? Here's the pitch, and it's smashed right Summer, summer fruits from California. Fresh from the tree, taste of the sea. Fresh plums are one of the good things that make summer, summer. But like summer, they'll soon be just a sweet memory. Summer, summer fruits, it wouldn't be summer without us. Can you serve tacos at home that taste like they came from a fine Mexican restaurant? Si, Ortega! Can you get crispy taco shells made from fresh corn instead of processed corn flour? Si, Ortega! And a chunky taco salsa with the flavor of sun-ripened tomatoes, fresh onions, and fire-roasted chilies? Si, Ortega! Yes, for the taste of authentic Mexican food, Si, Ortega! Si, Ortega! Si, Ortega! Si, Ortega! How many times have you wanted to bring your spouse or partner to our Twin Cities Live studios, but you were not able to because they work in the morning? Well, here's your chance to bring your husband or your wife to our show next Monday evening. We'll be taping a special edition that you won't want to miss. The topic, how to achieve the ultimate in sexual pleasure. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, no, not another program telling me how to perform in the bedroom. But our guests guarantee that if you follow their technical yet sensitive advice, you'll have a healthier, happier relationship. So come join our studio audience next Monday night. Bring along that special someone to share in the experience of Twin Cities Live. And here's the number, 641-1298. Tickets are free. We'll see you here. I want to uh, pass along a couple of uh, phone numbers uh, that you might want to jot down at home. Uh, we'll put them up on the screen so that you can write them down. These are cocaine hotline numbers. And uh, are they here? They are not here. I will get them for you in a couple of minutes. What was it you were saying during the break? I was just saying that if we start off being strict with this and the kids that are coming up, maybe they'll just decide that I don't need to get into drugs and they'll back off before they ever really get into it. Like in foreign countries, they have so many um, strict laws about things that they just cut everything in the bud kind of. And we seem to have so many problems because we're so lenient on everything. And why can't we? If we start with the testing, okay, the kids are going to see that, you know, if I want to play sports, I don't want my name smeared in the paper with, uh, connected with cocaine or whatever. I don't want my career ruined before it starts. Maybe they'll think twice about ever getting into it. Is don't let a kid get to that point where he has to be tested. Start educating him now. How old is that little guy there? Eight, nine years old? Thirteen years 13, old. Thirteen. Start him now. You know, then he'll know. He won't have to go through the testing bit once he's 22, 23 years old, whether it be in sports or any phase of society. That's a terrific thing to say, but the fact is that a 13-year-old kid who grows up in the ghetto uh, is all of a sudden offered the opportunity to go to school for free, live in a dormitory that puts him in a special environment, eat special food, be treated differently, have a tutor all the way through, and be given drugs by people who are boosters of the, of the school, and then go on to college and, and uh, pass college without ever taking the classes that are required and go out and make a million dollars. Now, you tell me that a drug education program for that kid's gonna make a difference? Let me, let me, let me say this, <clears throat> is, is that I, what I think you have to realize is yes, we do have a problem in our society and we certainly do with athletics. And we were talking about the issues of testing. I'm not so much against testing uh, myself as, as, as Greg uh, mentioned. I don't think that's the problem with the players. What I'm against is people taking drug testing as a sole solution. 
You know, I have a program where it's Emergent Hospital, the Triumph Life Center is what it's called, and it's based on the fact that people can recover. And this is what all of us here, certainly the recovering people are here talking about, with the proper kind of program, with the right things, uh, including education, mm -hmm. people can recover from it and go on and lead productive lives. In fact, they can get better. Good morning. You're on Twin Cities Live. Go right ahead. Okay, going back to the basics, um, there's one point I wanted to make, and that's with any privately owned business, whether it happens to be a sporting uh, business or whatever, I think that uh, the owner of that business has the right to institute any rules and regulations that he wants his employees to abide by. But at the same time, I think if you've already signed a contract under one set of rules, you shouldn't change the rules in the middle of the game. That's the only thing that we're saying about our collective bargaining agreement. And, uh, you know, like I said, the players are not opposed to any kind of drug program. We all agree. We just don't like the way it's being implemented. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now there's something new at your local weight loss clinic. It's the Fast Finish program. Only $49. It's designed for people with pounds, not time to lose. When I was overweight, I never would have done this. Teresa Williams lost 45 pounds at the weight loss clinic. Now that I'm slim, I find myself doing things and going places like never before. Thank you, weight loss clinic. I can't tell you how much my life has changed since I went to weight loss clinic. Carol Williams lost 62 pounds at the clinic and went from a size 20 to a size 8. Every day seems special. I get compliments from people. Thank you, Weight Loss Clinic. If you have pounds, not time to lose, get the Fast Finish program for only $49 at any weight loss clinic. It can help you lose up to five pounds per week. By popular demand, this special offer has been held over through this Friday only. So call today. Remember, only Weight Loss Clinic can give you the fast finish for your weight problem. Call now. This is his third bad report card. What are we going to do? His grades are not getting any better. It's essential that his parents seek help. At the Sylvan Learning Center, we teach young people basic math and reading skills. In our highly motivational and individualized atmosphere, most students experience over one year of academic growth in just 36 hours of instruction. Sylvan Learning Center, 888-0990. That's Sylvan Learning Center, 888-0990. Say, Tio Sancho, I'd love one of those great snacks you cook up, but it's uh, game time. I see. Uh, if only you had something hot and crunchy. Like these new extra-large crispy nachos? Oh, oh, sounds great, but don't tempt me, because I gotta run. With specially seasoned melted cheddar cheese? Just what I want if I had the time, which I don't. Try these new Tio Sancho microwave nachos. Mmm, delicious! I thought you were in a hurry. Who's in a hurry? Mmm. Introducing Tio Sancho's microwave nachos, the delicious snack you thought you didn't have time for. Uh, yeah. program at Samaritan Hospital is called Triumph Life <coughs> Center. The number is 642-9369. And the national cocaine hotline is 1-800-342-8722. Go ahead. Yes, uh, starting next month at uh, North Dakota State, they will be testing all their athletic programs, uh, the teams. And I was wondering if Mr. Weiss thought that this might be a snowballing effect with nationwide with all the colleges. Well, you know, as, as Carl said, I'm not a grand against drug testing per se. But I think any drug testing would have to definitely. Hotel accommodations and dining provided by the Radisson University Hotel, 615 Washington Avenue Southeast on the University of Minnesota East Bank campus. Limousine service provided by Henderson Shoford Cadillacs. Hair and makeup provided by the Terrace Hairstylist. 2004 Hennepin Avenue, Minneapolis. How many times have you seen the coaches in these young athletic programs, first thing they do is head for the, for the bar after the game's over? I've known a number of top coaches that were in amateur sports that uh, they should be through testing themselves. All right, let's I, test uh, the coaches too. Let's see, let's find out how credible they are. 
we're all in favor of that, and we talk about that off of the air. I do a lot of seminars, and I go out and talk about how dangerous drugs are and uh, what they can do to the kids. And after the coaches get done listening to my seminar, exactly, they go right to the free bar in the hotel room. I personally have had a lot of problems with that. Uh, one of the things we were talking about was um, hitting the kids while they're young. There was a survey of the Twin Cities. Important notice to all Americans born between 19...